We come together, let us leave behind the weight of the week past and open our hearts to the endless possibilities that God's love brings. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr. Thanking you as always for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is leading the way as we make our way through February. All right. So with that being said, let's get started. Hope you had a great Valentine's Day, by the way. We are in Psalm 5, 8 through 12. Psalm 5, 8 through 12. And we begin here with the saying, Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Such a lovely psalm for those who are maybe going through a situation where you are dealing with difficult people and you're wondering what's next what do i do well you go to the lord in prayer that's what you do and we'll pray with you if you go to our website www.get-prayer.com we would love to pray with you and we want you to share your story of how you also came through with the lord and how the lord took you under his mighty arms and protected you from the adversary. And we want you to share the testimonies as well as long, along with the prayers. But right now we're gonna pray. I want you to grab somebody in the room, hold their hand and let them know that better days are coming and we're praying for better days right now. Gracious and loving God, in the midst of our struggles and the challenges we face, we come before you with an open heart with all of our open hearts, seeking your light in the shadows of our lives. You are indeed our refuge and strength, a constant presence that guides us through the storms. As we gather today in worship and fellowship, let us ask for your hand to lead us toward these better days. Lord, we pray for those among us and who are listening, who are watching, who are burdened by sorrow, illness, or adversity. We don't know what people go through during the week. We don't even know how to get up in the morning. What that looks like, what kind of pace does that set? We pray they're with you in their thoughts, but we know these old hearts get in the way. And sometimes where we should be praying, we're doing other things. Help us stay focused. That's my prayer today, Lord. Help us stay focused on doing the right things first. Maybe find comfort in your loving embrace and strength in your promises. Help us see beyond the current trials to the hope that lies ahead, knowing that with you, each step we take is a step closer to renewal and peace. We ask for wisdom to navigate the complexities of our lives with grace and for courage to face each day with hope. Inspire us to support one another, to spread kindness and compassion, but above all, share the gospel to a world that's lost its way. Thank you for your endless mercy and for your promise of better days to come. May our faith in you be the anchor that holds us steady and may our lives reflect your love and glory. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, our strength and our redeemer, amen. Our topic today is the quest for true treasure. The quest for true treasure. Now, I know probably when you heard that title, you're probably thinking about Indiana Jones. For us 40-somethings, <laughs> maybe some of the millennials, who knows, you know, but when we think about adventure, we think about a character who who is out there traveling around the world trying to save iniquities from the enemy and all the things that go with that. But in this quest we're talking about right here, 
We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about heaven. We're talking about being in front of the throne of God and being in his presence, in worship, in praise, and in truth. So go ahead and turn your Bible to Mark 10, 17 through 23. Mark 10, 17 through 23 reads as follows. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to evaluate our hearts right now. Help us think about those things that would keep us from following you right now. The things that we desire, the things that we enjoy, the things we've acquired. Help us compartmentalize these things and examine them and say, if Christ came right now and told me to give this up, could I do it? because that's the real question here. Could I do it? These and all things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the heart of the gospel, according to Mark, we encounter a, a story that challenges the very essence of our spiritual journey and our understanding of what it means to truly follow Jesus. Mark 10, 17 through 23 presents a encounter between Jesus and a man often referred to as the rich young ruler. We've all heard this term. The story not only invites us to into a moment of inquiry, but also serves as a mirror reflecting the condition of our hearts and the direction of our lives. The first thing I want you to look at here is the inquiry of a seeking heart, verse 17. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, man ran up and knelt before him asking, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This moment encapsulates the universal quest for meaning and purpose. It goes to show that you can be as successful as you want and yet God will put into you, it's already ingrained there, you just gotta let it out, this wonder of what must I do to inherit that? The man's approach, running and kneeling, demonstrates urgency and respect while his question reveals a deep yearning for the eternal. This interaction invites us to reflect on our own search and meaning and the ways we approach Jesus with our deepest questions. And then we get to the challenge to understand God's goodness. We see that in verse 18, where Jesus responds, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. The response isn't a denial of his divinity, but a challenge to the young man's understanding of good. In a world where goodness is often measured by human standards, Jesus redirects our focus to the absolute goodness of God. What does that mean? This world, if you go by the measure of goodness in this world, it's very subjective. Uh, what might be good to you might not be good to someone else. We often, you know, when we see our favorite entertainers and musicians during November giving out Thanksgiving turkeys, we think, oh, well, they're good people. When we see our movie stars uh, responding to tragedy, we say, oh, well, 
that's good. They're, they're good people. But then when we look at the context of what they do beyond their scheduled goodness, I like to say, something's not matching up. The math ain't mathin'. And then when we try to call that out, you're accused of judging. Y- y'all have seen this system. You've seen this cycle. This is what happens, especially on social media. Rappers will give money to 200 homeless individuals and then go spew violence in music. Entertainers will sit there and watch communities crumble and then give $1,000 when they're worth millions and when they have millions and they'll think they're doing something great. But it's, again, it's all this earthly discussion on how we define goodness as well as the measure of goodness, the length of goodness, the context of goodness. And does it really matter what I do outside of the goodness I'm doing for you because that's my business? I'm giving you something, be grateful. It's a very Canaanite t- uh, way of thinking when you think about it. Cain gave and wasn't it wasn't accepted and he was mad and you know because it was in his mind, well I gave you something, Lord. And we every now and then we we come across people that think this way. Well, I gave you something, be happy. Regardless of how you see them living, regardless of what you hear them saying and the the standards they support and the, the biblical worldview that they reject. They gave you something. Goodness, people. Goodness, this is complicated stuff. This is this is very complicated because we want to every you know, it, it it's a habit of Christians to apply the biblical standard for goodness on secular individuals that don't serve God. And then we get upset. We have the, the audacity to get upset when they fail us. Because you forget. Their version of goodness is not God's standard for goodness. Just because you see them do good things does not mean they're good people. Be careful with that. Be very, very careful. Jesus invites us to examine our perceptions of goodness and to anchor our understanding and aspirations in the character of God himself. And then there is the reminder of the divine commands. Jesus recites the commandments, not as a checklist for eternal life, don't don't get it twisted, but as a mirror to reveal our need for God. The young man claims to have kept all these from his youth, yet his presence before Jesus hints at a recognition of something still missing in his life. How many people you know have followed the Bible all their life? How many folks you know have claimed that they've been holy and they're super holy and they're super, super holy and yet they feel like they're still missing it. They still feel like there's something lacking in their worship. There's something lacking in their study. There's something lacking here. Yeah, it is. It's called relationship. You've been doing all the religious things. You've been... Uh, all the behaviors of Christianity, all the behaviors of serving the kingdom of God, but you don't have relationship with whom you are serving. Think about it. You don't have relationship. You, you're right. You're missing something. You're very, you're very correct on that. Like the rich young ruler, you're missing something, but. You don't know what it is because you've never pursued it. Maybe until now. Maybe you're somewhere watching or listening right now and you realize that, yeah, I've been going to church all my life and I never really knew why. Yeah, I got baptized, but uh, I thought I understood, but I really don't. Yeah, I've been reading the Bible all my life, but I really don't connect to it. I don't know why. And that's because of this thing called relationship that you don't have. You have acquired degrees, successful jobs, you got a great spouse probably, good kids, 
a dog that might listen every now and then, a cat that does not care probably. You're in a great neighborhood. You're not in the conditions you were raised in. Though you don't disrespect your guardians or parents, you've done a little bit better for yourself. And now you're in a better neighborhood and uh, you know, you can, you're jogging in the morning, you're working on your health and you're watching your diet and you don't have the same friends and you've acquired new friends that are educated and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're winning with you. And you know, you see your old friends every now and then, but you know, you've moved up, you've acquired some different, uh, pleasantries here in life and yet you still miss the point and you know it. And you're probably writing right now, listening to this on the podcast, or maybe you're watching at home on Roku. I don't know, but you know, you're missing something because you sit there on Sunday mornings wondering about this portion here of your life because you've done all the religious things, but you've done them without connection. Here it is. This part of the story challenges us to consider the role of God's commandments in our lives, not as a means to earn God's favor, but as a guide to living in a way that reflects his character and goodness, which leads us now to the part that you are missing, the call to radical discipleship. Jesus, looking at him with love, said, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus is calling for ultimate surrender and ultimate relationship here. Jesus is calling for the rich young ruler to take everything he has earned and all that, give it away, sell it, whatever the case is. Scripture says, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Who can do it? After everything I just mentioned five minutes ago, can you give everything up that God has called you to give up and follow him? That's the question that you and I have to answer. When we say that we as believers want to do the will of God on earth through Christ Jesus via the Holy Ghost that lives inside of us, the real question we have to ask ourselves is, are we available? Beyond everything that we've acquired and achieved, the question is, are we available? That, that's it. It's not, it's not about anything else. You can have all the zeal you want to serve the kingdom and not be available. Every time opportunity comes up that God puts in your pathway, oh, well, I can't do it because of these reasons, or I've got this going on, or I've got that going on. No, don't get me wrong. Life happens. I'm not saying life don't happen. Life happens. But every time, every time you're called to put your hand to the plow, and you can't even do that much because of all the things you might have to give up. Sacrifice, maybe ideologies, maybe uh, uh, that could be an issue for you. You have this view of the kingdom in your mind and now you might have to give that up because it's not looking the way you had imagined it. Maybe Christian work, maybe the work of the kingdom may not look the way you had thought it was going to look. Maybe you found yourself going to Honduras or going to Chile or going to, uh, I don't know, Spain or Japan to help a small area that's poor and you're going to go help build them a church. And God says, no, no, and I need you to follow me down the street here to the hood. Um, we need to hand some hot dogs and hamburgers out to some kids that might need a meal that day. Now you're nervous because <laughs> it's hitting close to home. Sometimes God's greatest availability for missions is home-based. But for many, they don't like doing that because it doesn't make them feel accomplished. 
are you available? That's what it comes down to. Are you available? Jesus, looking at him with love, said, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. This is the crux of the encounter. Jesus' call to the man is radical and personal. It's a call to let go of what he trusts most to find the true treasure in following Jesus Christ. This moment beckons us to consider what we are holding on to that might be keeping us from fully embracing the life that Jesus offers. As we just said, are you available? Are you truly real with yourself right now? Answer the question. If God sent you opportunity right now, and this is going to those Christians out there that are on quote unquote on fire for the Lord and they they they're praying for revival, you know, is this is this crowd? I'm talking to y'all. If Christ sent you opportunity right now, are you available to do or are you not? Just be honest. Be honest for the sake of the rest of us. That way, if you're not available, we can go to the next person because God's work still needs to be done. And when you're available, you just come on. <laughs> you just come on. But it has to bother you, though, that you talk this talk but can't walk this walk. And what happens? We see the sorrow of a divided heart. Mark 10, 22. The man's divided here. His heart is divided. He, he wants to go with Jesus. He wants to inherit eternal life. He wants connection. He wants relationship. But he doesn't want to get rid of his stuff. He doesn't want to get rid of the things he's earned and worked for and acquired. And he enjoys his stuff. And before you know it, what happens? The man's reaction is one of sorrow. For he had great possessions. This verse exposes the heart of the matter. The struggle between the allure of the world and the call to follow Jesus. It challenges us to consider what possessions, desires, or ambitions may be hindering our commitment to Jesus and his kingdom. Yes, Christians, there are things in your house right now that could be truly blocking your ultimate quest for that true treasure with Jesus Christ. It could be getting in the way. It could be your spouse. It could be your children. It could be anything and everything you feel that you have acquired. Now, now though that's the, 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 the wording is important here. Do you feel like you've acquired it and I don't understand why I got to give this up and I shouldn't have to give this up and this isn't fair? Or did God give it to you and you're being a good steward of it and when the time comes, you can relinquish control and authority and go do what God told you to do in the first place. That's where we are. Otherwise, you have a divided heart. Here's the thing. Here's the heart truth about wealth in the kingdom. And we see this in verse 23. Jesus looks around and says to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Why, Why does he say that? Because... That man walked away. <laughs> he walked away from Jesus because he didn't want to lose his stuff. Everything he'd earned, he was like, I, I can't do it. He could not do it. He could not do it. And there in heaven, somewhere, is this man's blessing, waiting, still wrapped. <laughs> They're in the, uh, in, you know, in, in the post office, they have that pallet where all the mail is that, you know, that people haven't come to pick up. There's all sorts of stuff on that pallet, gifts and items and who knows, some probably money. Because they just didn't put the effort in to get up and go get it. This is the rich young ruler here. He, he did not put the effort in didn't trust. I think that's the part that bothers me the most. Here you are, you're looking at it as an item, so just something else to acquire. And this is pretty much what this was for him. He had acquired everything else and he had money for it and could afford it and he bought it and he bought it and he bought. It. And he's thinking, well, I'll just, I'll get this too. 
I will be confirmed that I have done everything to acquire this too, and then I'll be good because I will have everything I need to live a comfortable life and knowing that when it's my time to die, because he will die, okay, well, I'm good. But when he realized the cost of what it was going to take to acquire what he had felt his needs to get, he realized there wasn't an amount in the world that he could afford to acquire this. It was too much, the cost was too much. If this had been a few blessings over his head with oil, he would have been good. If this had been, oh, well, if you just do these three things right here, you're in, that would have been good. But oh, Jesus Christ hits right to the core. He says, do these things, sell, give them, and follow. Can you do it today? Can you do it? This encounter between Jesus and the rich young ruler challenges us at the core of our being. It invites us to reevaluate our priorities, our understanding of true goodness, and the cost of discipleship. The narrative closes with the call for introspection and, of course, transformation. A call to pursue the true treasure that is found in following Jesus. So what do we do this week? Here's what I want you to do this week. Examine your heart. Look around your house. Get a good look at your family. Examine your heart. What, what, are you, what, what are you seeking and prioritize? Ask God to reveal anything that may be hindering your relationship with him. Do that this week. And then remember who gave you everything so that when he calls for you to give it away or sell it or whatever the case may be, you don't have such a grasp on it. So that begins with maybe embracing some radical generosity, you know, uh, spread it out, spread, spread what you have out, maybe to give more generously might be finances, time, resources. Don't be so tight with what God has given you to where you can't loosen the spigot a little bit for other folks to drink from it. And that's something that we all practice on a daily basis when it comes to time, finances, and resources. Those three things usually is where we find sacrifice the hardest. And then commit to following Jesus fully. Reflect on what it means to truly follow Jesus in your daily life. Identify one area where you feel called to deeper obedience or sacrifice and take the step of faith to follow Jesus more closely in that area. Wherever that's at, I want you to focus on that this week. If Christ has called you to follow him into a situation that involves some sacrifice, consider the sacrifice and ask yourself, can I drop this right now and just go do this? Or is there something tugging at your heart that's blocking you from following Christ in this area? It might be an area of ministry. It might be an area of helping someone or helping a neighborhood or helping an organization. Whatever the case is, consider your heart. And as we ponder the encounter between Jesus and the rich young ruler, let's be challenged and inspired to pursue the true treasure of a life fully committed to following Jesus. And if there's anything that we can do here that can help you out there, I want you to contact us via the information provided earlier on the show, get-prayer.com. I'm going to get it right here soon. And that way you can email us your prayer requests and your praise reports, and we would love to hear from you. So until next week, may God bless you, may heaven smile upon you, and God willing, we will see you then. But think about what's blocking you and consider the pathway ahead with Christ. You take care. <laughs>